Hello there, welcome back to the podcast. And today I am joined by an old friend of mine, um, Ansha Clean. Clean? Clean. Clean. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Clean. Clean. Okay, yeah, I won't do that. <laughs> I won't try and do it because I'll just say like I'm in hello, hello or something, which uh, wouldn't be very appropriate. You're anyway, hello, Ansha. Very, very good hello. to see you. Hello, Gerard. Nice to see you. Um, we were in Flowers in the Dustbin together, of course. Mm. And what I wanted to talk to you about today, which we will come on to, is uh, building your own house, which I thought an incredible achievement. And also uh, more kind of matters more esoteric as well. Um, but if we could start off by a little bit about your upbringing and, and particularly in reference to kind of, you know, how it's made you sort of the person you are today, really. So what's Ooh. your story in that respect? Yeah. Um, well, I was born in the Black Forest in southern Germany, beautiful countryside. Um, my mother was a sort of hotel maid. My father was sort of training to be a um installation mechanic i don't know what you call it in english you know heating installations sanitary and heating okay oh uh, yeah i mean i know what you mean i'm not sure what you call it either <laughs> yeah i don't know so i grew up much because they both had to work i spent a lot of time with my grandparents um and my brother was born when i was two my sister was born when i was five but my parents had already been divorced at that point so my sister ended up living with my father and a second wife and my brother and I stayed with my mum and we ended up eventually after a few stops in Hamburg, which is where I grew up from age seven or so. So I went to school there, the usual thing. My mum obviously had a hard time as a single parent making ends meet without any professional standing or any education or anything. But she, she did really well. So she did evening classes and became a secretary eventually and sort of, yeah, managed okay, I think, for, for her background. Um, so what made me, I think that alone is already something that made me who I am, just seeing my mum, how strong she was and how she did her own thing and how she... Um, you know, managed all the challenges and the the war zone with my father because that was a really terrible, <laughs> terrible um, continuing war between them, legal battle and everything. Really? Mm. Yeah, it wasn't very nice. And um, so my mum was, in that sense, she was she was a, a you know like. Um, a role model you know for the strong woman <laughs> who manages and you know does her thing um but like i said she has no educational background at all so only sort of village school and so that's another thing that made me who i am i never had uh, that kind of intellectual guidance if you like you know there was never a dad who told me how the world works and my mum didn't know anything herself either. So I, I always had to go out and find out for myself, um, which brought me at age 13 to astrology, <laughs> you know, because I wanted to know what is life about? Who am I? Why am I here? And um, that's how I got into astrology at age 13. And I think it also predisposed me to the rock and roll and punk rock sort of thing, you know, just being being an outsider a bit, you know, with my family background. And um, yeah, so if you like, that's what made me who I am. And I dropped out of school, as you know, and went to went to live in the UK, in London, when I was 17, which is where we met when I was Absolutely. 17. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've, you've got a tale that I think would be, which I know, but I think would be uh, worth repeating regarding when you got to London really because it ties in quite nicely with the fact you end up building your own house I think what I'm talking about is when you got there and there was nowhere to stay oh you mean when I first visited <clears throat> because when I came to live yes well what happened is I I'd made up my mind I mean my first visit to the UK was when I was 15 on my own I went to stay with a with a family in East London, just, you know, I didn't know them. I just 
went on a boat and went to stay with them, which was amazing in itself. And then I decided I wanted to live in London. Um, obviously, my mum wasn't happy about that. Um, and I had made friends, and I had a friend in, in London who I was supposed to stay with. This was March 83, I think. And he disappeared. So there I was in London, and I didn't know where to go, <laughs> you know, who, who to turn to. Uh, it ended, you know, I ended up finding someone who, who I knew over sort of uh, friends. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that was, that, that was a, a sort of a weird experience. I thought he was dead. And in the end, it turned out he joined the Foreign Legion. I don't know, he'd gone oh, really? through something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blimey. I thought he was dead because his his landlady told me, well, he left, but he left all his luggage here and he disappeared and I never heard of him. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, he's dead. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, so. Interestingly, who did I turn to? One of the numbers I had, I'd previously meet, met the year before I'd met um, a theater of hate when they were in uh, in Hamburg. And I had Terry Razor's, their manager's telephone number. So actually, the first thing I did was call him up and say, Terry, help me. I'm in London on my own. I don't know what to do. And he was really good. You know, he invited me to, to his office and he sort of phoned up the, the airline and tried to get me a ticket back and all sorts of things. And so so that's also an interesting, that, that, that sort of made a connection with, with the theatre of hate who, who, as you know, influenced me a, a great deal um as well and i found the job as an au pair at that time so i went to the au pair agency and found the family in ealing the borthwicks and yeah and a few months later i yeah i did it <laughs> i came to london and and lived there for nine years yeah must have been exciting and scary in equal measures i would think so uh, you go into a completely different country where you don't really i mean you may know a couple of people vaguely but there's no there's no security in that is there i suppose no i think i've always been reckless in a way i, I wasn't really scared i don't know i, I just I should have been scared. I mean, especially when I was 15 on my own in London. I mean, quite frankly, there <laughs> are quite a few dodgy situations where I should have been scared. I would never have let my daughter do that at 15. Mm. Um, but no, I, I just, I don't know. So you, you got into the punk scene, or you, you were already into the punk scene, but you got into the punk uh, scene in London. I don't know, not really. I wanted to... I wanted to be a, a rock and roller. I wanted to make music, as you know. I mean, I bumped into you, um, and I'm not even sure. I mean, we didn't meet as such, but you were sort of next to me at the Furio gig in 83. This was autumn 83, I think. And that inspired me. You had this fanzine, and, and I thought, wow, you know. And in the fanzine, I think it was saying something about flowers in the dustbin. And, and I started auditioning for bands so I got into the scene that way through bands and I joined the Wicked Kitchen staff that was my first I was trying to remember that name yeah <laughs> yeah they were evil oh god yeah so, <laughs> so I joined them and I I, I did the the singer um, job with them and that was great and it was a great crowd I mean you remember Finn uh, he knew everyone in the scene. So I met through Finn, I met loads and loads of people, including then later again, you and, and Flowers. And uh, another band I got to know through him was the TV personalities and um, started hanging about with them because I, you know, with Dave Musker and, and, and that crowd. And that's how I got into it, basically, by joining the Wicked Kitchen staff and then meeting loads of people. Finn was Jerry Damas. I remember we were we yeah. Finn and I. <laughs> I just I hadn't thought about this for so long. But th this squat in Camden, we we Finn and I moved into a squat in Camden, right opposite Camden Station, and it was just like so many people came and you know went in that place. It was like always open door, and one of the people was Jerry Damas because he was friends with one of the other guys in the in the house and we had jam sessions we had a we had a sort of little rehearsal room in the basement and we were jamming together you know there's always something going on so that's 
and then London and, and Camden and Camden Lock and Dingwalls and all of that. So that was my sort of my sort of scene, yeah. When I was pretty lucky to be sweet eighteen. Given that you could have like sort of ended up anywhere in London, it's pretty kind of fortunate to end up in Camden, really, isn't it? Rather than well, well I won't well, slag off any areas, but we all know. You know, I mean, my mum, I remember when my mum came to visit me, <laughs> she stayed in the squat and, and the roof was, there was a, there was a leakage in the roof and, and the water, we had, we were sort of collecting the water in a bucket and my mum had to sleep on the floor and there was the only telephone in the room where she slept and people kept going in and out my poor mother she was really shocked what, what, where I took but she took it in her stride <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't your normal sort of uh, place to live uh, yeah squat in Camden you know I didn't stay there for all that long I think six months or something before I found found a proper place to live was that when you became the au pair and Ealing? No, I was the au pair to start with. So I was an au pair for six months or something. Then I uh, had a boyfriend and I moved in with him and that didn't work out. <laughs> and then I went to the squad. Ah, and after okay. that, I moved in with another friend in Camberwell. Yeah. So, you lived in Camberwell, did you? Yeah. I mean, I don't... Did I know you at that point? Well, yes, I think so, but but not... I can't remember. Not yet. With I mean, I knew you and I knew what what you did. But I think we met. I think we met at Dingwalls while I was still. But I can't remember if I still lived in Camden at the time. I think we met uh, when you and Flowers were doing a gig at Dingwalls. Mm, which would have been Finn again because he used yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Finn gig. Finn put on a gig for you at yeah because he used to organise that. Yeah, yeah, and he ended up singing for Menace, didn't he? Which was uh, yeah. something I didn't expect, I've got to say. But uh, and sadly passed away, of course, recently. Finn passed away. I thought you knew. Yeah, sorry. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, in the last two or three months, something like that. Oh, very sorry. sorry. I, I, I genuinely really. No, I, I, he used to be on my Facebook friend list, but I haven't heard or I, I had no contact with him really. Mm. And, um, I, so, I can edit that bit out if you want. No, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. But, yeah, sorry, I just absolutely presumed that that you knew. Um, no, okay, I'm well, let's. Away. I'm far away in Germany here. You know, it's another world. It's another world than than the world, the Finn world from from the eighties. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. You were talking about being an outsider, um, or feeling like an outsider, or whatever. Do you think there's a sort of congruency between feeling like an outsider and wanting to get into the kind of whole rock and roll world oh, i don't know i think I'm trying to think what motivated me was actually wanting to change the world because i thought things weren't good you know even looking at the world today i find there are similarities the 80s you know and what was going on early mm. 80s in the world and cold war and you know nuclear power and threat and war, what have you that this whole sort of no future feeling that our generation had right uh and i thought um music was a way to um stir people up especially punk music you know to move people to stir people up and to sort of that way maybe bring about some sort of change it was a idealistic sort of idea that i had but but that was really i wanted to you know make make a point and 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 put a message out and then the whole lifestyle came with it and and seemed to in the end was more important than everything else but the original intention you know was sort of philosophical in a way if you like um mm -hmm. and uh, it's still this is the 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 continuing in german we say red thread like you know what moves through your whole life is is that change how do you think we did then our generation regarding changing the world 
I don't think any generation does particularly well, really. I mean, we're, 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 when we start talking about what needs to change, and I've, I've thought about this so much, there are layers upon layers upon layers. And I am now with, with this um, MA course I'm doing, I'm reaching the sort of one of the bottom layers, which is our worldview, which is our um, basic cultural assumptions about life. Um, so unless we change that, and I'm talking about the mechanistic, materialistic uh, worldview after the scientific revolution. Mm. Um, and unless we change that, and we're talking a few hundred years of cultural conditioning here, uh, I don't think any generation can, can really do very well. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's so deep. You know, and sometimes I used to think, well, we can change something. And sometimes I thought, well, maybe the whole thing just needs to collapse. The whole system, whatever you want to call it, you know, the way we live just needs to really sort of hit rock bottom before people consider properly the change that is deep enough to actually follow through in the real world in the end. I think we did do okay, though. You know, I mean, I think we we changed. Oh, little yeah. Things. Compare, I mean, look at look at my daughter's generation, and I just think, oh my god, they're, they're you know, I mean, they're not doing anything. They're just sort of um, not mm. political at all. Not interested. Well, in they've grown up in a different world, haven't they? Theirs is the world That's of right. Twitter and TikTok. This is the conditioning that has sort of um, just got stronger and stronger and stronger. So yeah. in that sense, yes, if you compare it with, but then, you know, I feel like the old generation, I say, well, our generation, we did this or that, you know, and compare all the young people, today's young people, you know, they, uh, so I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, um, change takes a long time, and we know how difficult it is to change your own personal habits, you know. Change is also constant, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. nothing is ever in actual stasis. So, yeah, um, no, of course. It's, it's, so ultimately, it's a question of how hard you want to be on yourself, really, isn't it? Well, in some yeah. ways, you know. Yeah, but 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 change change is never never easy. You know, it's never sort of. Um... Yeah, at least we stop people wearing flares. You know. <laughs> yeah. More victories. More victories. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, t tell me about astrology. Um, you got into it into it at thirteen. Is that kind of the way I'd expect by sort of reading the daily stars in a paper or something? No, no, I don't know. I think it was um, it was a coincidence actually uh, owed to my mum because uh, she had a a new boyfriend and wanted to know you know if it was suitable or not. And she got herself this book about astrology. So obviously she only wanted to check, you know, star sign compatibility. But she, by coincidence, got herself a book uh, that actually explained how to calculate, because those were the days before computers, right? How mm. to calculate and interpret a horoscope properly. Uh, she never bothered with that, um, but I did. <laughs> and, and so I spent um, many afternoons after school and evenings trying to teach myself and did, teaching myself how to calculate because I wanted to know what my life was going to be about. I wanted to know who am I? What am I here for? You know, the usual big questions. I don't know if all teenagers ask those questions, but I did. And, and I found it very interesting what uh, what I learned there about other people because obviously I wasn't just looking at myself I was looking at my family I was looking at friends so I was doing all my friends birth charts and my mum's friends birth charts and all of that um, so I found wow you know there is something to it so it's just like learning by doing and I hadn't been conditioned uh, enough yet to 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 dismiss it you know so I was open to it and found it to to work and so I stuck with it all my life and I've been doing it I mean I don't practice it professionally yet I think I will eventually um but but it certainly accompanied me all all, all through my life and it's been a very very helpful um companion 
you say you found it to work. This is uh, this is probably a point that I'm sure some people listening to this will be desperate for me to follow up on. Really, um, <laughs> sure. How you know, not everybody is convinced by astrology, shall we say? And um, so I'm quite curious as to how you found it to work, and also what you would say to people who can't see any logic or rhyme or reason to it, really. Well. What works is what gives value to you, what, what is valuable to you. So if you find out something that is of value to you to, to find out about or to think about and to learn more about yourself and to learn more about, um, let's say, your personal talents and what, what yeah, you could say purpose, but purpose sounds pretty fatalistic, you know, what what would be good? What would what would be a good idea for you to do with your life? And you know, which direction would be a good idea for you to go into? If you find things through astrology that that inspire you or give you um, direction or give you uh, a sense of meaning, well, then it works. So, if you don't. Uh, if you don't believe this is possible because of the predominant world view of materialistic, you know, cause and effect and, you know, how is it going to work? Is it rays or magnetic fields or what have you? Well, no, it's a completely different world view that astrology is based on. This is what I was referring to earlier. Um, the scientific revolution has basically made astrology ridiculous. You know, if you go by a scientific, uh, by the scientific worldview, then you cannot help but dismiss astrology, because in that Newtonian world, view, essentially, I suppose. Yeah, no, well, yeah, yeah, but no, everything material. That, that what is the universe? The universe to ancient people. The cosmos was a place of a certain order, you know, of cosmic order of the stars and constellations up there reflecting life on Earth. It was like everything was one and everything that was above was below and what was below was as above. This is the old hermetic worldview and as it is inside, it is outside. So that is a worldview that we no longer have in our society and our culture. But this is the worldview that astrology is based upon. And it's similar as tarot. It says if everything is one, then the problem and the solution are one. So if you have a problem and you formulate a problem, then the solution is already inherent in the situation because everything is one. Everything is together. So, yeah, but how can you explain that to someone who is used to thinking in terms of cause and effect and material uh, influences. It doesn't work like that. So when we talk about what is astrology, then we have to first pose the question, is there anything beyond material life? So the soul in old fashioned terms, does it exist? Do we have a soul? So the old worldview um, was based on the idea of an, of an ensouled cosmos and ensouled universe the anima mundi oh, what? And anima mundi the world okay. soul okay the soul right the world so everything was soul and um th th this is a view that many indigenous people still hold i was just i've just finished reading a book about the kogi indians um, in colombia and they they trace back their culture to uh, 2000 BC, which is also around the time that astrology developed in Mesopotamia. Um, so their worldview, they have a very similar idea as Plato already sort of said, is that everything is one. Everything came out of thought. So for them, it was thought. Plato talked about ideas, eternal ideas, like archetypes that are within the world soul. Now, the Kogi Indians say that the first thing that was, was was undifferentiated being, which was pure thought, pure spirit. 
and out of that came the earth and came the eternal waters and out of that came the earth and the stars and everything so their cosmogony was it's like the beginning is thought and they 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 place a lot of emphasis on how how they think and to keep order in their way of thinking because they say whatever you think is what will materialize you know it's like everything starts its existence in thought and thought is immaterial you know i mean no scientist has yet measured and weighed thought or love or consciousness so but these things do exist so yeah i don't know i've, I've given up trying to explain this to hard uh, core uh, materialists uh, because you know, i was going to say how do you deal with the point yeah. um it's like um we have we have this is what i meant change you know it's like people are brought up in this with this worldview because this is what we are taught at school this is you know we we sort of breathe it in throughout our whole lives this worldview it it surrounds us it is everywhere in the media you know everywhere is is a purely materialistic not so much mechanistic perhaps anymore but materialistic worldview that basically everything can be explained or should be explained if it is of any value in terms of material science okay. i guess you probably didn't have such an involved response when you were 13 though so no i when when you got into this was it kind of uh freaky in the sort of world you lived in the social world you lived in no no i mean this is like teenage stuff you know so uh, i enjoyed the attention from my friends you know because they came to me yeah. for, I, I was doing cards as well you know not tarot cards but ordinary cards so i was reading cards and i was I was doing I was I was playing the the astrologer and 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 people came to me with their problems and and stuff you know and and that, that was that was okay they they knew I was the freak that was okay I was used to it you know <laughs> um no because like I said I didn't have a, a sort of scientifically oriented dad or anyone who told me oh you know this is my mum didn't think about it it didn't bother her so yes yeah, so i had the freedom to 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 actually follow it and it's only later that i found when i told people about my interest in astrology they sort of went yeah. you know that it didn't in england it's actually not as bad as in germany really okay yeah. <laughs> i've always thought of germany as somewhere where there's all these incredible esoteric thinkers and stuff but that was probably going back a few centuries which isn't yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no i mean uh, germany compared i mean certainly when i came back to germany and this is we're talking 30 years now <sighs> um it was a lot more materialistic and scientifically minded than than what i experienced in the uk oh, that's curious yeah and you did a fanzine didn't you yeah. in england sorry the one, the one off the one off sort of yeah utopia utopia yeah uh, i remember yeah. the cover had a kind of a cartoon of a bloke injecting something into his head or something yeah like that. that's right and i and i i have thought you know that this would be such a good image these days for certain <laughs> things that are going on but and i can't even remember the name of the bloke who did it for me but he was he was in the camden uh, crowd kevin something right what a fantastic fantastic image really good yeah what was in it i'm afraid i can't remember oh there was the interview with you and flowers in the dustbin yeah i remember doing that yeah yeah there was uh, an interview with kirk brandon and a bit about uh, spirit destiny i think it was already spirit destiny it would have been by that point yeah, yeah. Um, there was a bit about apartheid, you know, Nelson Mandela and stuff like that. Um, there were some poems that I'd written, poems, lyrics, stuff that I published a little bit about a revolution in our hearts. I thought about that recently. I thought, well, I 
actually, I still think that applies. And this is what I mean. The revolution needs to take place in our hearts. That's, that's really interesting because what you were saying about the German red thread, is you said, um, I, I, I feel that quite a lot at the moment. I feel like particularly doing these podcasts, funnily enough, is really... Well, the way it's working is I'm sort of thinking, oh, who should I talk to? And that in itself kind of makes me follow follow various directions. And I'm already finding that I'm finding some directions more interesting than others. And the direction I'm finding possibly the most attractive is kind of similar to the songs I was singing back in Flowers in the Dustbin. And so things don't really change as much as you, you kind of expect they would when you're younger. You wonder what you're going to be like when you're older. But well, I don't know about everyone, but I'm just kind of an older version of when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, hopefully, I mean, I can agree with that. And even though people would say, well, you've gone far off. And, and I know a lot of people sort of accused me of, um, what was the term, selling out when I when I built the house and when I started a regular job, which I needed to pay off the mortgage, obviously. Um, but actually that was just, you know, a diversion, a means to an end, something I had to do to get the freedom, the independence, which is something I've always striven after to do what I do now, <laughs> you know, without having to work very much, luckily. So I have the time to study and to, do the things that I actually enjoy doing. Uh, so it was just, you know, short-term pain for long-term pleasure was always one of my uh, <laughs> um, guiding. Um, yeah, that, that's, I think it's really impressive. It takes a lot of discipline, I think, to do that, particularly when you're younger. A lot of wisdom to know that as well, that you can kind of uh, go for long-term results instead of short-term ones, really. You probably knew that better than I did. I would suggest. Yeah, but I, I wanted that house. I've always had the dream of having a house and a garden and growing my own vegetables and, you know, so that was the price. I had to pay for it. Yeah. That's how I saw it. And I paid for it 18 years. <laughs> and now I've finally paid it off. And oh, yeah. oh, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay, so you will come on to the house because that is, yeah. as I said to you before we started, that's one of the... Um, that's possibly the most unique thing. I certainly haven't talked to anybody who's built their own house. Um, <laughs> and in England, the people, well, the people I'm aware of that do that kind of thing, it tends to be kind of more like ramshackle hippie houses rather than yours, which is a real kind of pro proper house. That's probably not very fair on other people, but, you know, a proper house. You so. still haven't visited since it was finished, Gerard. I know. I know you're still building it, wasn't it, aren't you? When, uh, when yeah. I, um, yeah, you came you, you came to visit when it was sort of uh, under construction. But you when we did that gig together, in fact, yes. That's so. right, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it's it's next year, it's twenty years since I built the house. Jesus, so, really. Yeah. So um um, just let me remind you. <laughs> I'll uh, consider myself reminded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, um the the, the 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 house uh it, it was basically the only way for me to to um how do I start this? Um the, the idea the idea to build the house was necessity because there was no way I didn't have enough money to to buy a house, you know, fully finished. Because to get a mortgage, you have to have 20% of whatever you're paying for it in your own funds. And I didn't have that. So I bought the land first and, you know, sort of paid. Just it off. so people can be clear, you're, you're back in Germany now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so when, when you buy and build, building the house. Building the house, I, I bought the land and paid that off. And then that counted as the 20% that you need in order to get the mortgage. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's how I... How so I'm where do you start? If you've got, got a bit of land and you want to build a house, but I mean, and you don't know how, and I think you're not a builder by trade or anything like that. So, you know... Yeah, where do you start? Well, I spent three years while I was paying off the mortgage for the land. <laughs> I spent three years studying everything I could get my hands on in terms of ecological house construction. So I knew it was going to be timber framed. 
and I knew, you know, it's going to be highly insulated with uh, two layers of insulation and all these things. So I, I thought about it, but I, I had the advantage. I, my, my boyfriend at the time had just built a house himself and oh, I had sort yeah. of helped him with a lot of the work. And, and that's how I realized, I thought, oh, I can do that. So that, you know, that again was, was the sort of step that gave me the courage to do it on my own. And, um, and through, let's say, the mistakes that he made, that he admits to, um, we all make mistakes. I, there's loads of things here that I would do differently today. Um, I, I was able to work on that. So it was like a foundation for my own thinking. So I set about, you know, imagining a floor plan. You know, how to say I wanted a small, this was before the age of tiny houses, you know, but in a way, this is a, this is a big tiny house, you know, for, for the standards 20 years ago, it was a tiny house. Um, but it's, uh, it's a lot bigger than what we now understand uh, for tiny houses. Um, yes, but I just designed, I got a floor plan, you know, how, how do I want it, which is the cheapest way you save walls and everything. And then I went to see a, a building um, engineer. I should have gone to a proper architect. So that's another mistake I made. And he drew up the plans for me. And then when I had the money and the, the mortgage, um, they started digging. <laughs> <laughs> and started building so the the frame was built was finished in a day this is the wonderful thing so it was prefabricated in the timber uh, in the in you know who the people who 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 built it i don't know what what you call them in english um woodworkers you know but right, carpenters or is it small yeah it's I it's more involved than that is it yeah yeah it's a company so they have a big hall and in that hall, they prefabricate um, basically the timber construction for the walls, for all the four okay. walls. So they built right. the foundation, they had the foundation, and um, and then they just had a big crane and lifted the walls ready on the on on the foundation. And after a day, the whole house was there. So after was, a day, yeah. And on okay. the second day, they finished the roof so that it was um, closed. And then I started doing the interior. So I was actually bricklaying myself. They had put four um, big, um, so clay um, bricks they put on the, on the foundation and I was building the walls, the interior walls with clay bricks. So all of that I did myself. And um, but did you do a course on that, or or did you just do it as you went along, learn it as you went along? You learn learning by doing. It wasn't so difficult because one side of the walls had a had a wooden or a um, gypsum plate, you know, sort of uh, backing. So all you had to do is you had to mix the the clay mortar, and then just shove it there and then put the brick on and then so it's easy anyone can do that Just how long did it take the whole thing well because because i had to do so much myself because i didn't have the money to pay people to do it it took me six months um if i'd had the money to pay people it would have been finished in six weeks probably so timber frame construction is very quick and yeah, but no, it was okay. Six months, I think, is pretty good. So end of 2003 is when I moved in, yeah. And where were you living then when you were building it? In Rieden, <laughs> where, you, where you stayed with me. In Hanover? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. it's not Hanover. It's south of Hanover. So Rieden okay. is a little village south of Hanover. That's yeah. right. So it's about 50 kilometers. So I was sort of driving back and forth a lot and taking Tamara to school. And driving and taking her to school and driving home so it was it was hard work <laughs> yeah. it was really hard work yes i remember it I, I i was working really hard and i and i um i don't think i've ever worked that hard in my life since then yeah. but it was worth it 
it's, you touched on it being an eco type house. Yeah. So, I mean, today, it meets today's standards even. So it's highly insulated. It has um, two layers of insulation. Um, and it used to have um, sort of automatic ventilation and thermal heat pump, which is what they're now talking about putting into all homes. But I've gotten rid of that now because I wasn't happy with it. And I've got a wood burner now and that heats the house. And that's it. So I've gone away from this technological stuff and it's much cheaper now um, to run the house and keep it warm. Um, but yeah, it, it's, um, it's high standard. I've got a turf roof. So that is also good because it's open plan. It's a, I don't know what it's called. It's a house that is facing the south, open. So it's like, it's like, not like that, like a house is, but it's only like that. And then you have it like that. So we call it Pultdach, but I have no idea what it is in English. Um, so it's a, it's just the one-sided roof. And the, the lower side is in the north. And the, uh, the, the open side, which is two-story or one and a half stories, um, is in the facing the south. So in the winter, when the sun is low and you have the, the clay walls, the sun actually hits the clay walls and warms up the house. So in January, if it's if we have a sunny season, a sunny time, I don't need any heating at all because the sun will heat my house. In January, that's pretty yeah, impressive. January, February, um, I can turn off the heating if if we have like five days of sunshine because um, the sun will go right into my house and heat it up. Wow. And in the summer, when the sun is high, it's sort of, you know, it's still, it, it doesn't, it doesn't heat the house up so much because the rays don't, don't come in. So I constructed it that way and um, it's worked out. It's worked out pretty well and I'm happy with that. Um, and the turf roof sort of insulates it, you know, against the, because I sleep upstairs. So we have a gallery on the south side, but it's open plan. Um, and my bedroom is on the south side, uh, on the gallery. And normally underneath the roof, if you sleep directly underneath the roof in the summer, and especially the kind of summer we, we've had this and last year, uh, it would be Im impossible. But with the turf, with, a, with the soil and, and, and plants growing on the roof, it insulates uh, the, the um, roof so well that I, you know, my house keeps cool in the summer even though I, I i sleep directly underneath the roof basically fantastic i've just been looking on facebook to see if there's pictures it says nord site is that your house it's like in the snow let me let me show you <laughs> yeah I show me I, I don't know what you're referring to no okay so <laughs> that is that your house? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the house. And that is the north side. That's the lower side. So you see that is, and you see the sun through through the, uh, is, is sort of the high side mm. is, is south. Yes. So that, that was winter. Oh, yes. It's that's changed good. a bit since then. I've got a carport now. Have you? Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think there was another one. Let me just have a quick look. Yeah, one from the south. There, there should be one yeah. in the garden. Yeah, that one. That's the that's the south side. That's Tamara. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a while ago, but but yeah, that's the south side of the of the house. It's pretty damn impressive, I've got to say. <laughs> you must feel a real sense of satisfaction with that. I do, I do, and and, and uh, it's never finished. You know, it's it's all I always have to work on, especially in the garden. And there's always something. It keeps me busy all the time. Yeah, tell oh, me about the garden. I'm going to find some photos of the garden because yes, there we go. Yes, this is this absolutely yes. This has sort of been the project since I left uh, my regular job and have been uh, self-employed. I've had time to to do my garden again and actually fulfil that dream of growing my own vegetables and stuff. So that's that's an ongoing project because uh, it takes it takes years to really build up the soil and uh, and everything. So yes, that's my vegetable garden a couple of years ago. Yeah, 2020. And I got a greenhouse now as well. Um, oh, cool. 
I don't know if I but that that was my my COVID project. <laughs> I did that in in I built the greenhouse in um I don't think I've placed I've I've posted any anything of it. So the greenhouse I built in May, April, April, May 2020. Yeah, so um growing lots of stuff. So I'm basically self-sufficient in terms of uh, my vegetables. And since I eat almost exclusively vegetables, um, I don't need to go to the supermarket that much. <laughs> you know. Fantastic. Was that a learning curve then, growing your own food? Yeah, yeah, it still is. It, it is a never-ending learning curve. So every year, I, you know, I learn from my mistakes. You know, and things. Sometimes things, these things go well. Sometimes other things go well. Um, yeah it's it's an ongoing process it's a living dynamic thing the thing i've gotten into more now and i want to learn more about and you talk to someone about um permaculture is um using um charcoal in the soil to absorb um um yeah to improve the soil it's like black black soil you know the amazonian um I don't know what's it called in English. All of these things I learn and I read in German. I can't think of the translations. It's a certain way of, um, it's called climate gardening because the charcoal, um, it's not like charcoal that you use for for um, barbecues, you know. It's a special yeah. um, charcoal. Yeah. Uh, huh. I don't know the English words for it. I'm well, sorry. fair enough. I don't know the anyway, German words. What so. you do, what you do is you 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 put that together with nutrients, like you put that on the compost, and you put effective microorganisms with it. It's a kind of mix of microorganisms that uh, that are positive for for the soil, so good food for the soil. And you put that in your garden, and that not only um, is good for your soil and for growing your vegetables and everything, but it also absorbs um, CO2. So, oh, cool. okay. And um, this is a whole new thing that's, that's um, you know, terra preta. That's the word, terra preta. I'll tell you what, <laughs> that's a new one on me. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's sort of my my latest. But so it's an ever it's it's all it's like astrology. You never finish. You never stop learning. It's ongoing. It's always it's a never ending story. And and that suits me fine because I'm I'm a learner. I always want to learn new things. All the sure, time. sure. So, so tell me about your kind of your life now. What's a sort of a week in the life of Anchi like? You've got your you own your own house. You have got your mortgage paid off. You have grown all your own food, um, which is great. So, but what what fills the other time? <laughs> well, I'm a freelance um, project management facilitator, trainer. I don't know what you call people like me in English. So I do. Tra I tr I teach people project management. I give seminars. So. Um, I prepare them for certification exams and stuff. And so I'm a gig worker, basically. I get assignments. Sometimes I have a few, sometimes I don't have so many. But because I, I can now afford to live a cheap life, um, you know, I don't need I don't need to work much and this is what I enjoy. So I spend most of my time studying for the yeah, master's degree I'm working on at the moment. Which in is in astrology. Cultural astronomy and astrology at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, yes. Yeah. So you're in Germany, the university is in Wales. Is that is that an issue? No, it's a distance training course. So it's a distance. Um, yeah, they've always done it on distance. It's the only kind of um, course like that in the world basically and uh it's been going for 20 years or so um and we don't learn astrology there it's an academic course so it is on the role of astrology and astronomy in culture okay so right. 
it's not uh, they, they don't like us to to talk like astrologers you know it's, it's it's studying the background the history so the last module i did was history of astrology um and what is culture and how has uh you know the western culture for instance evolved through you know from alexander the great or from ancient mesopotamia from ancient egypt uh, through um, the Middle Ages to the, through the scientific revolution to today, what was the role of astrology and astronomy in ancient times and medieval times and in modern times? So those are the kind of questions we we study. So what's the role of astrology in your life? What um, did you use astrology to decide to build your house or decide where to build it or do you do you use it for the big decisions or the small decisions or any decisions no because it it doesn't i don't think it works that way i mean you can do it and some astrologers do what is called horary astrology where you ask questions or you can do electional astrology where you can choose a propitious time for a certain endeavor or activity but I'm more, um, I, I, I look at the phases, you know, you have certain phases in life, as we all have, and certain influences and certain um, planetary inf influences, which I don't mean in the material sense, yeah, uh, that inform me what, what is the quality of the current time what is this time good for and then i go about in my own personal creative way and try and find positive constructive manifestations for that so in a sense i look at how can i explain this it's not what should i do it's not you know a sort of outside uh, imperative you know because of this you need to do that um, it is more, it's like um, watching the weather forecast, you know, I want to do a hiking trip, I look at the weather forecast. Yeah. So I plan certain things. So yes, I knew it was generally a good time for this sort of thing. Um, but I didn't build the decision around that. I built the decision around the possibilities that I could see that that came up in my life at the time. Yeah. I didn't even, I mean, a no-go for many astrologers is uh, when Mercury is retrograde. You know, no astrologer or, or a lot of people, maybe not, not astrologers alone, but these days on social media, you know, everyone is going, oh, Mercury is ret retrograde. Well, yeah. I signed the house, co the contract for my land. I signed that under Mercury retrograde and I haven't regretted it so far. So, you know, there are certain rules that people think apply. To, it's, it, I don't think astrology works that way. I think it is an interactive thing. I don't think there is outside forces that bring about certain things in our lives. I think we as spiritual entities interact with uh, certain influences, if you like. It's like we have to play the game. And that's up to us how we play the game and how we, you know, interact with what is there. Same as with the weather, you know, when it rains, you can you can do all sorts of things and, you know, get an umbrella or your proper, you know, you you, you, you deal with it. You do something with it. So, um, yeah, the picture you're painting or the, the way I'm interpreting it might be a better way of putting it really is, is quite a sort of solitary pathway so to speak which i was just thinking of in terms of like uh in the context of us having been in a band together etc way back when do you do you think being in a band encouraged you to a solitary <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> it was you yeah, yeah. <laughs> you ruined it you ruined it <laughs> oh god I, I, that that at the end, at the start of that sentence, I didn't realise it was going to end like that. Really. I was just making up as I went it's along. It's all your fault. Mm. <laughs> and Chaz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no, funny. I think I think this is what I mean. Ever since I was a kid, I always had a sense of being sort of 
different and not fitting in. And that does make you solitary in many ways because you, you, you know, people just, un, you know, I mean, my world is so different. You know, my, my thoughts, my, the, the things I concern myself with. I mean, how to explain to sort of normal people what I study, you know, what I do, what, the, what I think about, what a, pe a lot of people can't, think, what does she waste her time on, you know, what's she doing there? A lot of people can't understand it. So you, you can't help but pull yourself back and do your own thing and just sort of, you know, live a, a relatively solitary life. Yes, I do. The um, people on your course, have you met them? I've met a few. People. I actually went to Wales um, in, in the summer. I couldn't drop by Gerard because I had to go straight from Heathrow to um, Carmar Carmarthen. That's okay. Um, I'm just wondering what you were saying about, you know, how do you explain this to normal people, etc. Are, are the other people on your course like like you? Do, do, do you I feel don't know. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't get to um, spend so much time because I caught COVID on my way and ended up spending the summer school where I was supposed to mix and interact with people alone in this student's bedroom. Um, you know, oh, That's pretty rubbish, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty rubbish. So I didn't interact as much as, with, with my colleagues as I would have liked to have. Yeah. Um, so I can't tell you, but they were all, I mean, there are people of all walks of life and all ages. There are astrologers and non-astrologers in that course. So it's not all people like me, no. There, there's a great variety. We have uh, rocket scientists and, you know, all sorts of different people from really all walks of life there. So um, Rocket scientists. Well, so when, you, when you're talking about astrology, you can say, well, it's not rocket science. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, no, she wasn't a rocket site, but she she was, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was something pretty outrageous, I thought, this this lady I'm thinking of. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, we and we don't, this is the sad thing about an online course, you don't get to interact much, because we have the Zoom sessions, you know, and then that's it, and you don't interact. Um, yeah, I've, we have discussions, but it's all discussions about the things that we study. So the personal uh, things that there, there really aren't any. It's, it's once a year that we have the summer school. So this time I, yeah, I went there, but <laughs> didn't didn't get the benefit of it. Um, next year, hopefully, I I have a have a better better luck and can interact a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you would hope so, certainly, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's um, yeah, yeah it's funny. Uh, it's funny thinking back about the band who we haven't really discussed at all, have we? Um, I don't know. Maybe oh, great that's... times! I think we had some fantastic times, Gerard. I I love thinking back to the tour <laughs> with Fuzzbox. Yeah, I think <laughs> we <were> uh... wild, <laughs> and we we well we had our differences. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, still it was a it was a good experience. I wouldn't want to miss it, you know. Yes, it was it was a memory, wasn't it? Lenin said that nothing. Sometimes decades happen without anything, and nothing happens. And then sometimes decades happen in weeks, and um, or something like that. I didn't get that right. Yeah. I don't, but but that that tour in a way, or just generally kind of that intensity of doing gig after gig, night after night did feel like you were sort of living a year in a month or something I oh, think yeah. yeah and I absolutely loved that about it and I really wish we could have done more of that truthfully the, the whole kind of touring thing and if we could have done it properly as in um you know had a tour bus and stayed in hotels like like what what proper bands do I think that would have been a real serious kind of interesting way to live I think or at least to spend no I don't know I mean, um, when I look at people who've done it, like Kirk Brandon, for instance, you know, I don't know if I would have wanted that lifestyle. Uh, do you know what? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right on that level. I, I look at some people I know who've done what I just said and been quite successful and so on, and I'm not sure it's done any of them any favours. <laughs> probably at the time, yeah, but, you know, long term, I'm, I'm kind of, 
yeah. Chaz once said to me that if we'd have got successful in Thousand of Dustbin, then the only question would have been who would have died first, really. And I think he probably had a point. Wouldn't have been you, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have stayed long enough. <laughs> no, probably I mean, not. This, no. This is, why did I leave? You know, it's... Uh... I, I can be quite radical as well when, when things don't go um, the way I think they should then I then I take my consequences and this is this is what I did with flowers and this is perhaps the reason for my solitary life <laughs> you know I could have had more fun <laughs> I, I apologise <laughs> once more <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but but we are, I mean, an, a famous astrologer, Alan Leo, said character's destiny, you know. I mean, yeah, is it, we are who we are, and who we are determines our life. and our Everything, life. yeah, yeah, sure. And yeah. basically, we can't escape that. So, so I think we had a fantastic time, and I think it was valuable for each of us in our own ways, you know, and we all learned. Yeah, it's like sort of like an intensive driving lesson course or something isn't it you learn a whole lot in a, in a short space of time really and that what, kind of what, what stuck with me the most was this process of making music and writing songs together like you know Chaz would come up with a bass line and you know or I mean not the songs that I learned that were already there but when we started doing doing new stuff yeah I think that worked this process of cooperation, you know, everyone doing their bit and it all falling into place and coming about. I think that was a magical process, which I really, really loved. Yeah, and the I evidence of which is still about as well, yeah. which is something we didn't expect at the time. So, so that's right. So there's different people and when they start making music, uh, these differences melt away and something is created that is unique and that belongs to all of these people mm. and yeah a magical process and, and that was a gift and i really i'm really glad i had that experience yeah so am i i'm sure all your adoring fans will be wondering if you're still making music no <laughs> my adoring fans <laughs> yeah no i don't i i haven't touched the guitar and i can't remember how long um it's it doesn't seem to be um it, it is perhaps because there's nobody here you know <laughs> it's just like i live in the middle of well in a small village you know in the middle of germany somewhere and uh if if i had friends around here who you know who were in bands or who who were you know if you lived next door gerard it might be different yeah it, it worked for me different. that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> and and um but but you know i don't say that sort of with regret i just think life moves in certain ways and you know you find yourself where where you find yourself and that that tells you this is this is what it is now and who knows what will be in five years and who knows what will be in 10 years if I'm still around. I don't know. It might, everything might change. You never know. But I made certain choices and I'm here and you make your priorities and music just on my own sort of it doesn't do the job for me anymore. It used to when I was young, you know, and had still lots of emotions and frustrations and anger and I could sort of shout it all out and that was good, but I don't need that anymore. <laughs> so That's much. fantastic. That seems like a really good place to to um, to stop. Actually, I, I will talk to you afterwards as well, and we can probably talk much more salaciously and so on. But um, yeah, okay. Thank you ever so much. I, I think for that I'll, recording you. bit, I will say thank you so much, Ansha. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. It's fantastic. Thank you, Gerard. It was wonderful. <laughs>